if we're ready for, with streaming and taping, uh, and no further ado, uh, we have uh, Code Pirates Cutlass. Um, Ozzy will be uh, presenting, so please give him a well, uh, warm welcome. Windows. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm I'm Ozzy from APL. Uh, so. Uh, quick show of hands in the room. How many people do software reverse engineering as as a part of their job? So you, okay, keep your hands up. Uh, it, it, so if if you don't do software reverse engineering, how many people uh, either work with people that do or you've done it in the past? Okay, so good 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 many of you. Um, that helps. All right. So what I'm going to be talking about today is. Um, is a mechanism, some research that I've done in, in uh, automated software architecture recovery from, uh, from, from binaries when you're, when you're reversing. Um, so for, for those of you that maybe aren't familiar or as familiar with, with reverse engineering, so much of what we do in InfoSec is built on top of reverse engineering. Re reverse engineering kind of underlies a lot of, a lot of things, whether it's you know, malware analysis, reverse engineering new programs to find vulnerabilities, right? Um, RE is manually intensive. It's very hard. You've got to learn a lot. You've got to know a lot about computer architecture. You've got to know a lot about code. Uh, you know, it, it takes a long time. Um, especially when we get into embedded systems, um, when we're, you know, when we're dealing with operating systems like Windows or Linux, it's, uh, it's a little bit easier. But when we have an embedded you know, a real-time operating system, we might be reversing, you know, a giant program that's fully linked, that's got no symbols, that's got no delineation between the operating system and the applications. It's tough. Um, we're used to, you know, this, this, this picture that you see up here where you're, you dump it in IDA and, and it's like, oh great, I've got 12,000 functions that, you know, I have no idea what they are. IDA didn't give me any you know, help, none of my, none of my, uh, you know, I, I can't match it against anything, and so I'm starting from scratch. I get this giant, nasty call graph that I'm trying to tease apart. Um, so pre previous research ha we've, has focused on, um, ha has focused on like, disassembly and decompilation, so translating code. Um, there's also been a lot of, of function to function um, matching uh, research, and, but, but it's, it's kind of been limited. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of explain why that's a problem and kind of what I did for that. Um, when we reverse code, we're operating on at least, at, at least four different levels when I, when I think about it. Um, and, and I kind of enumerate them here. Um, we're, we're going from, from opcodes, you know, all the way up to functions, and then we're also like, looking at functions in context and what those functions do together. Um, and we're usually switching back and forth between those, you know, on the fly all the time, right? So this is, this is awesome. This is what makes a human reverse engineer better than a computer. The, the problem is we're, a lot of the machine learning research and stuff like that is really kind of striking out um, because they're not really taking the full picture, uh, you know, in, in view. Okay, so from from here, I basically decided, okay, I want to I want to work towards automated RE. I want to work towards making my job reversing a a, a real time operating system and embedded operating system. I want to work on making that faster, and I'm gonna, you know, pick a pick a chunk of the problem to work on. So I call this the code cut problem. You're probably, uh, you know, familiar if, if you've done C development. Most of the stuff when we're dealing with embedded systems, we're dealing with C, and the the process by you know uh, the the way that it's developed and deployed, right? You developers write functions in different, you know, there are different functionality in different C files. They compile it into object files, and then, you know, it gets linked together in a binary, like real basic, you know, computer science stuff. Um, 
what happens, which you may not realize you know, under the hood, you probably have if you've, if you've um, stared at long enough, what your linker does when it builds your binary is it just takes those object files and it just squishes them on one after the other and does the linking. But more or less, you know, that, that code is still there in your binary in the same order that you pass those object files into the linker. Um, so the code cut problem is really given you know, this, this binary, um, can we find the boundaries of the original object files within the, uh, you know, within the binary? Uh, and there's, um, it, it's essentially, it, it should essentially be architecture independent. If um, you might be able to do things that were architecture specific, but it would be great if it was architecture independent. Um, there's also sort of an inherent, inherent ambiguity there because um, you, it, it's all kind of, the, the object file boundaries are kind of based on how well the designers, you know, uh, how well they segmented the functionality into, into different C files or different object files. If, it, if everything's kind of a mismatch, um, you know, you're, you may not be able to actually uh, recover what you want to. Um, okay, so the concept I came up with, so let's say you're, you've got a, got a C file, okay, and you've, if you can eliminate external calls, um, so just your, your, your pound includes, you're just talking about the functions the, with, within that C file, um, the directionality of the calls at the beginning of the module, at the beginning of the, the module of the C files in the positive direction, and it's gonna switch back over uh, to the negative direction towards the end. So the idea is really that the, if you look at just the relationship between the things at the top, they're being called by things at the, at, at, at the bottom, things at the bottom are calling things at the top. It's kind of um, sort of dirt simple, but the idea is that if we can find that, that if we can measure that directionality and find where it switches back, so where it switches from negative back to positive, and we can f maybe we can find those boundaries. So this is the fancy math definition I won't go into. Uh, all, this, all, all of the stuff I'm presenting today will be on, on GitHub later, um, so you can, you can stare at the equation. The idea is it's really, it's not exactly like a force function, but think like a, a force function where you're just trying to measure whether a function is being, whether it's more related to functions you know, in the positive direction or the negative direction. Um, so this is, a, this is a graph of the metric on a uh, target binary. Um, if you stare at it and you, you see some of the, uh, some of the labels um, and you recognize what this is, you should tell me I'll buy you a drink afterwards, but um, actually it's really hard to see the text there, but oh well. Um, hmm. Yikes. Well, the, the idea is that, so like we have some good, I don't even know if you can see the, well, <laughs> on my screen there's a, the idea is whenever you see a, a like, so, so here's, a, here's a, an object file, it goes from, if you follow the mouse here, it goes from high score down to negative score, back up, and then we identify a boundary there. Um, the cool part about this one is that sometimes when, we're, when I'm dealing, doing uh, embedded operating systems, people put in debug prints. This one had debug prints and assert statements, so it identified the the, the name of the C files, so I actually kind of had ground, ground truth, and so it pretty well li lined up, and I could see, okay, from here to here, this is actually the, the sysled file. Um, this is the really cool part, the, the really, really cool part, which the, the new part is, even if you, you know, so, so we, we do that, and we try to get it right, we don't get it, you know, 100%, um, but even if you have a, a sense of that, now I can chunk my binary up into pieces, and I can, in an automated way, graph the 
relationships between those segments of the, of the binary, right? And that's where I get my automated software architecture graph. So this, this is an uh, automated software architecture graph. Basically, you, you get this with, you, you load this into IDA, and you get this. And you, could, you can immediately, um, you know, some, some things pop out to you. For instance, like right here in the middle, this is like, so this is a part that was dealing with config parsing. So every bit of the binary had to load its configuration. So that's why you see that everybody's calling into it. Um, this is really cool, this structure here. These are modules that didn't have names. Um, but what, so what this is, is it's a static library that was linked in by some, some other component. You can actually see that, or sorry, it was linked in by this config thing. You can see that this subgraph, uh, besides these two, this part is only reachable through here. And so you can actually, so, so then you can say, oh, well, if I don't, you know, if I kind of get how the, how the config interface works, I don't even have to look at any of that code because I know it's only used by that, that configuration part. Um, so these are cool things if, you know, if, if you can get a, uh, a uh, automated software architecture. Some results, I won't go, go through there, but um, kind, of a, kind of a, one of my uh, axes I like to grind or, or kind of my, my main cause and maybe something I'll do after this is we don't have a lot of good data sets to do automated software or rework on because we don't have good data sets where we have source and binary and then, and then artifacts like, like map files and stuff like that. We have a lot, there's a lot of binaries out there, not a lot of map of source to binary. Um, so I had to kind of build up this data set. Um, basically, short story, it kind of works. Um, so this is the cool part, uh, or another cool part. I presented the last stuff at, at Recon in the, in the summer. Um, and man, yeah, sorry, that stinks. That, um, what you're supposed to see here, so I, I, after I was talking with folks at Recon, we were saying we had, there, there was a lot of trouble doing uh, graph algorithms on this kind of data set. Graph algorithms tend to be like very, um, they're, they're very uh, complex, very runtime inefficient. Um, and, but we were talking about could we use just some of the fact that you know, when we're talking about this graph, it's really just a one-dimensional thing. So can we, can we use the fact that it's one-dimensional to our advantage to make it um, more efficient? So I came up with this um, algorithm where we're, um, re so it's, it's, a, it's a graph algorithm where uh, what we're doing is we're measuring every possible place you could cut. So after every function, you're just taking the average of the call distances that cross that boundary. So you're saying any, any calls that go across, I add them up and I make that an average, and then, I'm, and then I cut the maximum uh, score that I, that I can. And I had a nice little graphic here to show you, but um, the, uh, so the, the um, yeah, so, <laughs> I can't really can't really walk through it, but um, the the cool part about so the cool part about that is that you're trying to you're trying to maximize the you, what you're essentially doing is you're you're maximizing the um, how connected the the two the two regions are uh, where outside of where you're making that 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 graph or sorry when you're making that cut and so you and you keep doing this. And this seems to work pretty well. It's, it's not as fast, so, so the, the first one I talked about, that's, that's order of n runtime. This is, this is n log n, but still pretty decent. So my next, next step is to actually run it on, um, on my data set and build out more of a data set. Um, the code is available on GitHub, so you can go download it. You can please try it out, you know, bug me. Um, it has some cool stuff in there. The stuff where it's figuring out what your object file names are, it does that based on like common strings and it looks for uh, you know, or strings that look like C files. Um, 
So yeah, ch check it out. Um, and I'll be adding the new graph algorithm to it soon. Um, that's my contact info. And yeah, that's all I got. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> And uh, be happy to take questions with the, the remainder of the time. Uh, that, that was the first metric, local function affinity. So it does the first way for now, and I'm going to add the, the graph one here soon. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to repeat the question on the other one. The, the question was, uh, why better success on one architecture versus the other? The, I don't think it has to do with the architecture. I think this was basically, um, like, for instance, you'll see this, this Contiki firmware I ha is like my be best one. It's MSP430. Good FET firmware is lower. Um, and so it, it, it it's not, I don't think it's really related to the architecture. The reason I, the, um, for instance, like the GoodFet and GNU chess, the reason that they don't do so well is they have, if you think about when you write a C file and you have global, um, global data and you'll, you'll have, and, and sometimes you just, like, you'll just, from another module, if you want to use that global data, you just declare it as an extern, or you'll write a function that just as like an accessor function that you call it and returns the value. Turns out when you do that, that function doesn't look like it's related to the rest of the things because it doesn't call them. It's just accessing the data. And so those, and those tend to be at the beginning of the file. So that's, that's what happens on the, on the good FET firmware and the GNU chess is that the, those, those functions get stuck with the, 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 the previous one and not the one that they actually belong to because there's actually no relationship in the calls. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good question. I don't think so. I think generally most of the time, so like on GNU chess here, it's been all within a single binary, so that's generally going to be all near calls. Um, so, yeah, I haven't looked at any like, like real x86 embedded firmware. Um, but no, I would basically treat those the same, and if, if it's far enough to need a far call, then you're probably, um, in, in LFA, that's probably getting thrown out as, as not a, not a, uh, you know, not, not close enough to matter. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you very much. I'd be happy to, uh, yeah, answer questions afterwards or um, happy to talk about APL too. Thanks.